Hello, welcome to this presentation at the RIS5 Global Forum in uh, September 2020. Uh, my name is Simon Davidman. I'm from a company called Imperus. We're going to talk a little bit in this presentation about uh, RIS5, the flexibility it offers, and the challenges that that face uh, designers and verification engineers when they're trying to verify their um, RISC V designs. So I'm going to talk through several different topics. The first is really um, introduce the issues related to RISC V verification and then try and clarify the difference between verification and compliance. Talk a little bit about how how verification is done at relying on reference models and the challenges that uh, RISC V designers face because of the ability to add custom instructions to the RISC V uh, processor. Then I'm going to zoom in and drill down into processor IP verification and look at some of the technologies and techniques that people use to do that. Introduce a little bit about SOC level verification and then wrap up. So first let's start and let's talk about the issues of RISC V verification issues. So a fundamental thing I think that we all have to understand is that RISC V presents new challenges. It's a new ISA and the key thing is it's an open standard ISA. And what it means that any designer can build a process for implementation. And if we look at the RISC5.org website, you know, we can see there's over 100 RTL designs already out there, whether they're proprietary or open source, based around this open standard ISA. Now, traditionally, processor IP, the RTL for building a process, comes from uh, uh, the ISA owner. And it's typically single source, and you get it, and it's fully verified. And as such, it's, it's validated and is compliant to that specific ISA because it comes from the owner of that specific ISA. And all that you need to do as a verification engineer is really to do the integration tests. So even though the ISA vendor has spent a lot of effort um, developing verification, there is no industry standard approach which everybody building the RISC-V processor can use. And there are very few available tools out there for processor verification. They tend to be internal and proprietary to the ISA developer. So the RISC-V industry and the ecosystem really needs to um, adapt these best practices of the proprietary ISAs and use them for SOC uh, verification, but more importantly, for processor verification. So let's be specific about the DB problem. So if you think of ARM, which is obviously one of the most successful ISAs out there, when they're verifying a processor, they do something like 10 to the 15 verification cycles. And this is publicly uh, produced information by ARM. So that's PETA cycles. And that is, you know, 10 to the 15 is a lot of verification that they're doing. And then they in have to do the verification of the interface between the, uh, the, the network on chip and the processor. And they've been very successful with thousands of SOC designs have been done. And the similar approaches in other companies from ARC and from MIPS and Tensilica. So it, it's it's quite a challenge because in the RISC V world, you know, you have to think, well, how well is this process verified? You know, if you're building it yourself, you know, it's up to you to choose how much verification you've done and what coverage. And then when you've got the process verified, you have to worry about the subsystems that it sits in. And if you're doing something in the AI machine learning space, you know, you might have 100 of these processes in there. And then you have to consider your interface to your device uh, and the uh, network on chip that you're using. And then what about custom instructions? Now, a lot of people talk about verification and, and compliance, and there is a big difference. So the device works within the envelope of the agreed specifications. That is what compliance testing is about. Does the device work in that envelope? It's really about have you read and understood the specification? And you know, it, it, it does sort of simplistic checking in that have you used all the registers as source and destination? Have you, have you looked at intermediate values? And the way it works is it captures a signature into a memory region based on all the instructions that have gone for that particular hardware configuration. And then it compares that signature against a known good reference. And it can be either static against a uh, um, uh, reference signature file that has been saved or it could be dynamic against the reference which is configured to be the same as the device under test. And it's not, in compliance testing, it's not attempting to stress all the possible aspects of, for, of the microarchitecture and all combinations. It's just not possible to do that. And 
Uh, so it's not attempting to expose microarchitectural uh, uh, issues and errors in there, or and it's it's the current uh, compliance uh, setup is that it's not going for the illegal instructions or unsupported things. It's only testing the known good results. And if you want to go further than compliance, that's what DV is all about. And one of the key challenges in in the methodology is that you have to know how good are your tests. And there's really two approaches that are used. One is functional coverage, where you, you look at what instructions and, and values you're putting through your pipelines and through your designs. And the other is, does that value propagate through to the output? And this is something actually in Empiris we've been working on, is to see whether, you know, if you make a change to a test, does that value propagate through to the output? And it's, it's done by a fault simulation technologies with mutators in there. And it really provides decode coverage. So to see if an observed change, uh, can, a change in the, in the decodes, etc., can be observed in the signature. And that's very important to see the quality. Again, that's not DV. And we've run uh, the, this uh, against, the, for example, the 32i test suite, where there's 48 hand-coded tests in there. And, uh, you know, there's not a lot of instructions in there. And what we found is uh, there were, uh, we ran millions and millions of runs, and we found there were a lot of the tests that actually didn't propagate some of the values, so we had to improve on those. And um, you can have a look at the quality of the current RIS-5 test suite at the moment. Um, today, the, uh, there are several test suites in the RIS-5 um, um, compliance uh, GitHub repository. Uh, for the 32i, there's uh, some 48 tests in there for that. And we've... Um, classified the uh, functional coverage as some sort of basic coverage where it just looks at operands and signs and things and was the instruction seen. And then uh, in the compliance group, we're developing a more extended coverage definition. And currently the existing tests only cover about 35% of those cases. And that includes things like marching noughts and ones through the different values, making use of uh, uh, checking that the operands are reused in subsequent um, as de you know, a register is used in more than one operand and things like that. And uh, from an Imperius point of view, we've also been developing compliance test suites ourselves under contract with customers. And one of the ones we focused on is the vector instructions, where there's some 500 vector instructions, and each vector engine can have many different configurations. And our, our current test suites are over 7,000 tests, and it does depend on the different vector engine configuration that you've got. And we've got three different um, customers using that, and actually one of them is presenting at this conference the results of what they've got there. And um, so, you know, the... The compliance testing is, is a work in progress still in the RISC V uh, international in the task group. So now let's move on. We talked a little bit about verification issues and, and compliance. Let's move on to the reference model. So one of the key things if, is, is um, with compliance and whether you're doing uh, uh, random testing is you need a reference uh, implementation to compare it with. And the, the purpose is that the, the reference... You know, you, you want it to compare with your design to, for the observed behavior, and it needs to be configurable for all the different um, aspects in the ISA envelope where you're allowed to make choices in there. And, for example, you know, you can say it's a 32-bit device or a 64-bit device with the X end. Well, the vector engine, you've got a variety of different parameters and then actually different versions which have incompatible versions of the um, instructions in there. The bit manipulation, again, there's several different versions which are incompatible. People can have custom extensions, they can have a machine mode and user mode, but you know, supervisor mode, and there's all sorts of different options that you can have. And part of the challenge is because RISC-V is so highly configurable, it gets very complicated actually, because there's so many different questions you have to, to have to, and actually to, to to query the device under test and to find out exactly how it is configured and, and you need the reference to be able to do that as well. Now, from an Imperis point of view, for the compliance testing, we, we built simulators in Imperis and what we've done is we've made a version of our simulators available um, for free on GitHub as part of the compliance effort, which is a configurable um, uh, simulator which covers the full uh, RISC-V envelope. We provide the model as open source, uh, so that you can see how it works, and we keep it up to date on a, a weekly basis based on the specification changes, for example, on the vectors, bit manipulation. And we're actually working on, on some of the other uh, specifications at the moment. Uh, and um, uh, it's targeting at compliance. It does have limitations compared for DV. It's not targeted to be used for design verification. We have other simulators that do that um, as part of our commercial offering. So. 
And basically, the way the simulator works is you load an ELF, you can get uh, information out of it, you can use it in a debugger and things like that. Um, but a, a DV reference model needs a lot more than is available in the, the free compliance one for custom instructions, for asynchronous events, for things like debug mode, and to support more advanced uh, DV flows. So um, we have our, our RISC-V model in Imperus, and it's used as a reference, and we provide, as I said, a version of it available in the compliance group. We also have it available for our commercial users as a full reference, which supports all the, the, the multi-heart stuff, allows you to add custom instructions, you can inject uh, an, um, asynchronous flows. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the uh, Stefan Compare, and it's used as a golden reference by a variety of different companies for their silicon as they go out. Now, our model is pretty sophisticated. It's evolved actually over 12 years, and it's not originally targeting for risk 5 it's targeted to be a, a, a very sophisticated environment for developing models, and the models can have a variety of different parts in, in it. It's all subsection. And uh, uh, currently we've done over 300 different processor models, which is uh, 12 public ICE and 7 proprietary ones, of which risk 5 is just one of those. And there's a sophisticated set of tools that work with it so that you can make use of this model. Uh, we have a whole flow for adding custom instructions that um, is usable in a RISC-V world and actually also in an ARM world. And um, the, the flow basically has several main steps. But basically what you do is you, you um, characterize your application on the top left here. You characterize your application. And um, we have timing information in there so that you can get sort of approximate timing information. So you can do full timing and profiling of your application when it's running at a sea level, running on the simulator. You can find out where it's spending its time. Um, you can then work out which instructions are, the, where the, are slow or sequence of instructions and add new instructions, add them into your application, add them into the model and the timing, and then re-characterize it and, uh, using the technology and iterate around. And then when you're happy, you can actually wrap up the model and make, check it's compliant, use it as a reference in your DV, use it for software development. And we have a, a presentation on that also at this um, risk 5 um, a global forum talking about this flow of how people do custom instruction development. So now let's um, focus on the processor IP uh, verification and how processes are verified. So there are several choices you have to make when you're developing your um, uh, uh, hardware DV methodology. One of the first is are you going to use directed testing uh, or are you and um, uh, or are you going to use random testing? If you're going to use directed testing, you need to work out whether you're going to use a self-checking methodology or a reference compare. And if they're self-checking, you write the test so that you know what the behavior is and you introspect it and check it, and the test then sort of passes or fails just on its own. So, so that is very good for relatively simple things. Um, but if you want more complex things with asynchronous nature, it's very hard to do that. And sometimes you don't know when something is going to happen. So it's better to have a, a reference comparison where you don't predict the result and you consult the reference when you want to know what has happened. So at runtime, it can be asserted rather than uh, um, just right, hard coding into the program. So that's the first choice is whether you're going to, you know, with direct testing, whether you can self-check or, or reference compare. And if you are going to do a, a, re a reference compare, you have to choose whether you do it with a sort of a, a trace signature compare where you do it after the simulation or you do it as a step and compare. And the decisions around these things, it's all about the resources that you have because DV already takes a significant part of the, the resources involved within the SOC. And, you know, you need to choose which resources you've got to and, and where you want to deploy them. Um, and a post-process uh, comparison, which is a trace or a signature base, is, is often challenging because the failure is never known until the simulation is completed. So it can be a long time, not long time before you get the results. Uh, things might get into loop conditions, fill your disks up and everything. And often, you know, you just know that it's failed or passed and it's very hard to find where it's diverged and that sort of stuff. And, and you can waste a lot of time in there. Whereas a step and compare methodology allows it to be flagged the moment there's a comparison. So every instruction um, retirement, you're checking all the values and the states of your whole machine. And so that's a much more efficient point of, of checking for that. And so in Imperius, one of the things we've done, we've taken our reference model, we've made it available in a system Verilog um, uh, module in there. 
and again, it uh, can be a custom one or it can be the standard uh, foundation compliance one, and it can be a single processor or you can put multiple processors in there. And it has all of the, the logging and, and tracing capabilities and can work with the debuggers and things like that. And the way the encapsulation works is it basically takes the, the, the C model, the OVP RISC-5C model, provides using the uh, system variable DPI some access into the model and provides system Verilog tasks and functions so that you can control it from your system Verilog from your test bench uh, point of view just like you can run any other uh, system Verilog uh, model and what it does it not only does it have the control so you can sort of step it and reset and clock it but actually you've got access to all of the GPRs and the state with inside it and you can actually feed in uh, asynchronous events as well and get a lot of information. And the way that's used is that model is encapsulated in its system Verilog in a test bench where it runs with the device under test, uh, the RTL, and you load your programs up into the memory, run the two uh, side by side, and at every instruction trigger, you're comparing the results in there. So you, you, get, uh, you can just get a log out or you can actually get it to stop at the appropriate point. And not only have... Um, uh, you have the ability to do the step and compare. We also put in the sort of the capability in there so that with the uh, standard Verilog simulators, you can make use of cover groups and cover points and get full functional coverage. So you know exactly what you've actually tested in terms of your design. And if you've got system Verilog uh, coverage, you can use uh, standard tools. This is an example using the Mentor Questor, and you can see which instructions have been executed and uh, how many times and what registers and values and all that sort of stuff in there to do functional coverage. You can know how good your testing is. Now, a lot of people not only use directed testing, but they also use a lot of instruction stream generation where they have random streams of instructions and where you give the generator guidance as to what instruction types you're trying to focus on and a lot of constraints. And it really uh, will go off and generate you legal programs, um, but it doesn't know what the results of those should be. So it really does rely on having a reference um, comparison in there. And it's a well-established uh, methodology for SOC design flows to be able to do that. Um, there are many different uh, instruction stream generators out there. I think I've counted seven or eight different ones. Uh, we work a lot with the Google one, which we see as one of the best, in that it is really focused at driving the RISC-V core through different corner cases and pushing it to the limit. And it uses the Empiris simulator as a reference to compare um, under, uh, um, at the end of simulation with the device under test. So it's a post-process through a neutral uh, format. And... Um, it also includes functional uh, coverage in there. And that the, the basic flow is, again, like the step and compare, but it runs through to the end of the simulation and actually runs and uh, writes out log files, which it then compares. And there's a, a subsystem which provides coverage. And one of the things for customers we've done is we've added the, the vectors and the bit manipulation. We did those 219 and put those in there so they could see the quality of the tests that, that they were putting through their, through their design. And we've extended this to support this uh, sort of step and compare. And actually, we've been working a, there's an open hardware group of doing a RISC V um, core based on ETH0 uh, pulp cores. And they, uh, they're using the Empiris reference in exactly this type of flow for a step and compare, where they have directed tests and random tests, and they are generating uh, instruction streams. And then they compare them with their core, their RTL, and against the, the Verilog uh, simulator in there to see the quality and uh, to see the moment there's a divergence in there. And they're using us as a, a reference model in that. Uh, another group that uses uh, uh, Imperius RISC V simulator in a, with the Google instruction generator is the low risk guys uh, building their IBEX uh, core. And uh, with the Google generator, what uh, they found is lots of different issues and bugs in there, uh, in there that they reported. Um, Google wrote a very good paper on, on what was found on this. And, uh, you know, the, the, the bugs are in... in uh, all over the different bits, but some were sim simple instruction stuff, some was more asynchronous uh, things in there and branches and things like that, page faults. So some pretty sophisticated bugs found with these types of methodologies. Uh, we also uh, work with other companies, and there's some uh, commercial tools out there, uh, a really high-quality one is from a company uh, called Valtrix, where uh, they use a, a reference simulator, but what they do is they generate the direct and random tests use the reference, capture the results, and include those into their code 
so that they produce basically an ELF file that they run on the device under test. So it's actually a sort of a hybrid approach. It's, it's sort of a directed test in the end because it runs on its own, but actually underneath it's actually using a, a reference and uh, producing the results from a reference. So a, a very interesting approach and complementary approach to stream generators. So and we talked uh, a bit about verification, a bit about compliance and reference models, just a little bit on uh, SOC level verification. Um, so, you know, assuming we've got our CPU core verified, then we're going to start saying, well, okay, how do we verify the interface between the processor and, uh, and the, the network on chip? And there are very uh, verification IPs that you can get for network on chip, and it all takes effort to do this. And you have to do this because you have developed the core. If you've purchased um, a silicon IP for a processor, then you can assume that they've tested it a lot with the network on chips and, and provide verification for that. But if you're building your own core, you have to do a lot of that SOC level verification there. And then often, especially in the world of sort of AI and machine learning, people are putting multiple processes in there, communicating through shared memories or, or queues or pipes between them and everything, FIFOs between them. And people are building their own architectures, their own flows. They are going to have to invent and develop their own methodologies for verification for that as well. So getting the CPU verified on its own is the beginning. Then you have to worry about the integration into the, um, into the, the SOC platform. So to wrap up, so design verification, it's a critical issue issue for RISC-V processors and the SOCs. And compliance is a test, is a, is a subset of that. Compliance testing is just a subset of DV. It's sort of, it's the introduction. And typically what people do is they do a lot of DV and right at the end they should run the compliance test and just see that it does actually uh, pass the compliance. They shouldn't be using the compliance tests as a sort of the first level of tests that they're building. Uh, in most modern methodologies, um, a reference model is needed in there to compare whether it's a signature based or trace based or step and compare. You need a reference model, and that's really the expertise that um, that, that, that Imperius uh, brings to the RISC V ecosystem. And you know there are many different approaches for processor IP uh, verification, uh, directed testing, instruction stream generation, and uh, you know there's lots of people doing different things in there we found that the best approach really is to use a step and compare methodology because it's the most efficient. It, find, it, it will tell you the moment it, it finds an error. And often errors can be masked if you're using a, um, a uh, signature-based um, uh, methodology because it may be that the instruction doesn't propagate the value to the signature for whatever reason. So, you know, the best is step and compare. The next is a sort of trace log compare and then a signature basis, the third there. So, you know, more work is needed in, in, in the area of hardware DV around RISC-V processors. I haven't really talked a lot about the, the um, uh, issues related to DV of custom instructions, but again, they can be treated the same as other instructions. But um, one thing's for sure is in the RISC-V world, there's an awful lot of verification that is needed. So thank you very much for listening to this presentation. If you need more information, there, um, there is, you can send us an email at uh, info at .com or look at the websites for more information. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much indeed.